Good evening. The police say they have made some progress in their investigation into an outbreak of terrible violence on a street in Ilford last night, which left three men dead. Witnesses described a scene of absolute chaos after a fight broke out between two groups of men from the Sikh community who were armed with knives. Two arrests have been made and the police say the suspects and the victims were known to each other. Simon Harris reports. Even in a city with London's appalling murder rate, this was shocking. Not one, but three victims in a single street on the same night. Lewis O'Donoghue heard a noise and looked out of his window to see paramedics trying to revive a man on the ground. It was just chaos, absolute chaos. It was like something out of a movie. It's, it's horrific. Then I looked up uh, and seen a second body, uh, and then again performing CPR on him. Um, and I, um, then I looked over that, and there was another body, a third body, one to the left, two on the bottom of the stairs, and it was, it was like a bad day in Bosnia. Police believe two groups of men began fighting outside Seven Kings Station near Ilford in East London yesterday evening. What happened next isn't clear, but not long afterwards, three men were bleeding to death in a nearby street. Today, the area was inside an extensive police cordon. People are really, really shocked. I mean, look, you know, like every part of East London, Seven Kings is where I grew up. It's a bit rough and ready, but at the end of the day, this is something which is beyond the norm of anything that's happened here at all in recent times. The police quickly realised the dead men and their attackers knew each other. We believe that all those parties involved, um, the victims and those involved, the suspects, are from the Sikh community. By early this morning, a 29-year-old man and a 39-year-old man were under arrest on suspicion of murder. The challenge for the police now is to establish the chain of events which ended in such violence. Local politicians said they were unaware of any tensions in the Sikh community. But people living here told another story, one familiar to many Londoners, of gangs, drugs and violence. There's drugs, there's drinks and drinks and alcohol and, you know, it's just... It's, it's getting this spiral and out of control. Teresa Johnson is a cabbie who's lived here for 21 years. I just see an anger in, in people, you know, that I never used to see before. And I think we need to get to the bottom of to, as to why are they fighting against each other. At the nearby Gurdwara, they were trying to take in what had happened. Everyone is shocked, you know. Everyone is shocked. Everyone said a very bad thing happened. This never happened before like this. This is something unheard of, so I couldn't even possibly start to explain any tensions because I've not noticed it and certainly the people I've spoken to haven't noticed it either. In the third week of 2020, there appears to be no let-up in the bloodshed which is destroying so many lives. Simon Harris, ITV News, Ilford. Good evening. In the aftermath of the last terror attack at London Bridge, when two young people were stabbed to death, the question of whether more could have been done to stop it echoed throughout the investigation. The attacker was already a convicted terrorist who had been released early on licence. Well, today, the government announced what it called a major overhaul in the way offenders like him are punished and monitored. It plans to use lie detectors to work out whether people convicted of terrorist offences are still a risk to the public. And it says it will force convicted terrorists to serve the full term of their sentence. Our political correspondent Simon Harris reports. Can you phone and put your arms up, please? When it comes to lie detectors, Patty Musicaro knows the truth. She's one of the country's most experienced polygraph operators. Happy to demonstrate today on one of our producers. The bulk of Patty's work is testing people to see if they're cheating on their partners. And she doesn't think lie detectors should be used to check whether convicted terrorists have mended their ways. My concerns about using this to find if a jihadi has been reformed is the accuracy of the test. It's just not good enough. At, the, at, at best, it's 75%. Why is that? Because we can't do tests uh, for anything to do with thoughts, feelings, intentions or emotions. It has to be about an action. Did you do this or did you not? The terror attack at Fishmongers Hall next to London Bridge in November is behind today's announcement from ministers. Jack Merritt and Saskia Jones were stabbed to death at a conference on rehabilitating offenders. Their killer was Usman Khan, a convicted terrorist released from prison early. He was shot dead by police. The new proposals include scrapping early release, a minimum 14 years in jail for the most serious offences like running a terror organisation or preparing acts of terrorism, and lie detector tests to gauge the likelihood of re-offending. 
we've already used polygraphs and lie detectors in the context of serious sexual offenders. We've been using them for about seven years or so. They're part of an approach. They're not the uh, sole basis upon which we assess risk, but they have been proved to be a useful tool. Lie detectors aren't reliable, are they? No, by themselves they're not. If you look at some of the evidence, there's a mixed message uh, there. What they can do is give you an indication whether somebody who is uh, pretending uh, to be reformed isn't, but they're not 100%, they're not foolproof. And that potentially is a big problem. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. Remember, answer yes or no to every question. Establishing whether a radicalised terrorist still poses a threat could be a matter of life or death. The authorities can't afford for a lie detector test to be wrong. Simon Harris, ITV News, West London. Well, next from us, after more than two years of strikes, delays and poor financial performance, it is perhaps unsurprising that the government is as unhappy as passengers about the current service on South Western Railway. Now, the Transport Secretary has announced it could be nationalised. Our political correspondent, Simon Harris, is at Waterloo for us this evening. So, Simon, just how likely is that? Lucrezia, South Western took over running the trains out of Waterloo two and a half years ago and it's not been a happy journey. For most commuters, the biggest problems have been the constant strikes by guards in the long-running row over who closes the train doors. But behind the scenes, it's become clear the company is in financial trouble. Earlier this month, there was a warning South Western could go bust before the end of 2020. And today, the Transport Secretary, Grant Shapps, concluded that the franchise was unsustainable. So the government's now in talks with South Western's owner about replacing the franchise with a short-term revised rescue contract. But the unions think the government should take over the whole operation immediately. The franchise isn't working. It's clearly in financial trouble. Uh, the franchising system itself is obviously broken and not working. The obvious and clear option would have been to take it back into public ownership, but instead they're just using taxpayers' money once again to really reward the private companies for their failure, make sure they keep getting their profits, and that's, that's at the expense of the travelling public. Uh, Mr Shapps says taking the company back into public ownership, renationalisation, if you like, is still an option. It's one of the contingency plans being drawn up by his civil servants. But whatever happens, the government insists the trains will continue to run. The RMT has a different idea. Uh, it's planning to ask its members, the guards, if they want to begin a new series of strikes. Lucrezia. Yeah. All right, Simon, thank you. Ziggy Shepper was just a teenager when he was sent to Auschwitz death camp, one of five in total where he was imprisoned. When he was finally freed, he spent months in hospital before moving to London. The capital became home for him and his family. 75 years on, he is marking the anniversary of the liberation of the death camp, knowing he is lucky to be one of few remaining survivors. We're now a proud great-grandfather. He told our correspondent Simon Harris what he would say to Adolf Hitler if he saw him now. In a North London synagogue, a 90-year-old man lights a candle and remembers. His name is Ziggy Shipper, and today he's one of a handful of Londoners who can say, I survived Auschwitz. These pictures were filmed 75 years ago, when Russian troops liberated the most notorious of all the Nazi death camps, Auschwitz-Birkenau. Ziggy Shipper spent six weeks here behind the barbed wire and electric fences. He still remembers vividly arriving by train and watching German guards trying to separate mothers from their babies. The guards went over and asked him to put the baby down and go the other side. Can you imagine a mother doing? She wouldn't do it. They tried to rip it out of their arms, but they couldn't succeed. They even shot the baby and sometimes the mother as well. All we were thinking about is getting food, getting, because we had so little food that everything was starvation. How could we exist? I cannot understand it. I just cannot understand how we, we survived this. In 2005, Ziggy joined two other Londoners to return to Auschwitz. Today, he's the only one of the three still alive. Their pilgrimage then took them back to the bleak camp in the Polish countryside where more than a million people were murdered. The majority of them were Jewish. Some died of starvation or disease or were shot, but most were killed in the gas chambers. How did you survive? I wish I would know, you know. I honestly haven't got a clue why I survived. So many were killed. 
The only thing is, when I ask a rabbi or a priest or whoever else like that, they'll tell me he wanted you up, up there to survive, so, so I'll take it as that. Ziggy was 15 when the war ended. He made his way to London and was reunited with his mother. This week he celebrated his 90th birthday, but his greatest achievement, he says, is his family. Two daughters, four grandchildren and five great-grandchildren. If I would see Hitler now, I would show him my family and tell him, you see, you killed six million Jewish people, but you didn't succeed. We're still here and we'll always be here. Today, Ziggy Schipper still speaks in public whenever he's asked, determined to play his part for as long as he can to ensure the Holocaust is never forgotten. Simon Harris, ITV News.